Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is part 17 of What If Naruto Was in Rosario Vampire. If you guys enjoy this what if and want to see part 18 of it, comment down below and let me know. Then go ahead and check out other what ifs in the channel. Before we start please do support for more awesome content. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a like and also share this video with your friends. So let's start this video. They were in a power struggle, one trying to get over the other. The Susanoo's sword and three other unoccupied arms slammed against the chakra beast's zone and grappled its shoulders, the purple sword of chakra grasped tightly within its jaw. Naruto grunted, forcing more effort into the strength of the chakra. While he wasn't physically forcing Madara back with his own hands, it was extremely straining. But, no matter how much he tried, neither of them budged, and he was getting more and more frustrated with how calm the Chiha was. It didn't look either of them were going to be getting anywhere fast. Then he came. Sasuke. His best friend and the guy he wanted to beat the shit out of the most. The purple monstrosity that was his own Susanoo, formed while he was soaring through the air at Madara, ribs, arms, legs, armor and a helmet covered head. Keep him still, Naruto. Madara had noticed Sasuke's return just as he had been pulled back, trying to get out of the way of Sasuke, but Naruto held strong, and kept him at the standstill. Without fault, Sasuke's Susanoo slammed right in the side of Madara's and Naruto let go instantly, so he didn't get taken down with him. The two slammed into the sand with a thunderous crash, rocking the giant ditch they were in. Now's my chance. The giant beast that had materialized thanks to Kurama's chakra dissipated, leaving him in just a cloak of golden flaming chakra as he fell. He hit the bottom of the sand ditch and burst forward, reaching the two within just a moment, and slammed his palm on the blue Susanoo's rib hard enough to make cracks spread throughout it. Kanji started to spread over the chakra construct, but they soon started to disappear. Madara was absorbing the chakra infused in them. No, you don't. Sasuke's voice boomed, his Susanoo retching up before slamming its fist down on the other's head, forcing the torso of a ten feet under the sand, no doubt disorienting and distracting the other Chiha. Naruto grinned as the seal rapidly spread once more, covering the blue Susanoo entirely, all the while Sasuke kept laying into it with his thunderous attacks, not letting up for even a second. They'd won. It was the start of a new semester at Yokai Academy. When they'd gotten back, they still had a few weeks of break left, and for the first few days they just relaxed on their own, only bumping into one another a few times. But when those few days had ended, they started to hang out with each other again, and Sukune fell back into being trained by Naruto at night. His progress was very slow, but Naruto couldn't really blame him. The guy hadn't even used chakra before having a whole bunch of it shoved into his system. At least he could climb trees without the use of his hands. But now, it was back to the droning boredom that was schoolwork. Naruto made a disgusted noise in the back of his throat, pulling at the collar of the shirt he was wearing. I didn't miss wearing you, bastard. He made his way out of his room, making sure to lock the door behind him. How effective. He drawled to himself sarcastically, moving down the dorm hallway and ignoring the usual arguments and chatter. A school full of monsters with regular locks to stop anyone from getting inside of rooms. Naruto went down the stairs, squeezing through people, and even a couple that were making out against the railing. At the bottom, he had to bring up his hand to catch a brick that had been seen hurtling his way, and he lobbed it back in the direction that it came from, smashing into some dude who had a giant fly head and two pincers, where his mouth should be. It probably hadn't even been aimed at him, there was usually stuff like that going on in the boy's dorm, and he'd gotten used to it pretty quickly. Unlike some people. Sukune looked like he was glued to the wall he was standing that close to it, his eyes darting around, so he could see and dodge any objects that would inevitably get thrown in his direction soon enough. Naruto rolled his eyes. Come on. He said, walking past the other human and pushing one of the many glass doors open to the outside. Sukune caught up to him, looking much calmer. You think you would be used to mornings by now? Ah. He scratched the back of his head. No. He dropped his arm and focused on putting one foot in front of the other. I don't think I ever will. They pretty much rip each other apart before classes start. And I'm not a monster, I could actually die from what they throw around. Then get stronger, faster. Naruto retorted. I'm not teaching you to use chakra for nothing, you know. I know. Tsukune looked down at one of his hands and made a fist with it. I'm a lot stronger than when I first got here, but it's still nowhere near enough. Naruto was about to respond tell him that he needed to get water walking down Pat, but an obnoxious shout cut him off. Uzumaki. He glanced behind him to see the guy he nailed with the brick, the one with the fly hat and the pincers. He was holding said brick in his right hand, and there was a few others with him. Same heads. Same race, he supposed. What? You left this. The brick was hurled at him at a fast pace, but he easily stepped to the side and let it obliterate against the concrete wall behind him. Flyhead and his friends began to move forward on him, and he couldn't help but deadpan. Sukune, go meet up with the others. I'll catch up with you in a few minutes. Yeah, sure. Mocha smiled as she handed out another newspaper to a student. Please enjoy reading it. 
After the student had taken it, she moved behind the small stand they had set up and grabbed another handful of them. Noticing Naruto standing off to the side with his own set of papers, smiling pleasantly at a group of boys who refused to look at him. Naruto-kun, you shouldn't do that. She scolded. Do what? She frowned and further brows at him. That. Scaring people. You were doing it before break, too. Hey. He grinned cockily and puffed out his chest. I'm the big bad guy who beat up Kaio, remember? He breathed out through his nose and shoved a hand in his pocket. Besides, they picked a fight with me and lost. I just want to rub it in a bit. Mocha shook her head and looked down at the newspapers in her hands. They'd each written their own articles of the human world, yet none of them even mentioned the destruction of a city or the mass amounts of murder that occurred that night. There was one on the shooting in the marketplace that she and Naruto were a part of, but that was as far as it went. Mocha hadn't even heard of what had happened to the civilians that had managed to escape, or even what had happened after the city being destroyed. No doubt something like that would be getting attention from all over. And then there was Ruby, the witch just like Hikari. She came back with them to the academy, and the headmaster took her under his care. Mocha hadn't seen her much herself, but she was apparently in contact with Yukari quite often. Yahoo! Kurumu leaped onto Tsukune's back, her arms fling around his neck, making the teens stumble and almost drop the few papers he had left. This issue was also a big hit, most of them got passed out. The crowd of students that had pretty much been swarming them was now scattered around, talking in their own groups, some still holding the papers they'd received. Our work has paid off. Yeah. Tsukune's lips thinned, a gloomy look on his face. He'd been holding it off while handing out the newspapers, but it looked like now that the other students had cleared out the bad mood he always got in whenever the subject of their trip came up was out for them to see. Naruto elbowed him in the ribs with an annoyed expression. Stop it. Tsukune gave the blonde a dirty look and was about to retort, but Mocha chimed in. Hey. She smiled when everyone's attention turned to her. How about we have a party to celebrate? Arms still sling round the irate Tsukune, Kurumu smiled widely. Wow, that's a great idea Mocha-chan. Yukari beamed in agreement. Yeah, it'll be fun. Sure. Naruto shrugged before turning to Tsukune. And? What about you, Salty? I'm not Salty. His annoyed look slowly started to shift into one with a more genuine smile. But yeah, I'm in. Kurumu grinned and all but squealed, making Tsukune flinch. Great. Now, who else but us five are gonna come? What about Gin-senpai? Mocha suggested. Nah. Yukari immediately bit out, arms crossed in an X, defiance clear on her face. He's not coming. No way. Yeah, we don't need him. Kurumu added. He'll probably be too busy flirting with some woman anyway. Naruto rolled his eyes. I'll tell him about it later. Mocha flashed a smile at him. Didn't deserve to come to the party, he was the president of the club after all, even if he didn't do much in regards to said club. He'll probably try to bring a random chick though. Humph, fine. Yukari's arms crossed over her chest, eyes closed, an unpleased expression on her young face. But that means I can drink sake. Ah, but Yukari-chan. Tsukune said. You're a bit young for that. So? I was her age when I was allowed to start drinking. Naruto chipped his two cents in. Besides, it's not like she's going to become an alcoholic, and it'll be good for a laugh. Yukari grinned at having Naruto on her side, while the two teen boys began to bicker, arguing their points, and trying to prove the other wrong. Mocha smiled, it was good to see Tsukune not being so mopey. Hmm, you guys sure are weird. That voice was new, definitely no one she knew, or has spoken to. It was called like ice, but not exactly unfriendly. The newspaper club gets along well. Too well? I don't understand that kind of stuff. Mocha turned her head to where the voice was coming from. Her light purple hair was long, frayed up in a way that could be messy, but it strangely suited her. A white sweatshirt with long, dark blue sleeves reaching her wrists covered her torso, and she had the standard school skirt on, while covering her legs and going above her knees was a pair of striped stockings, both colors of them being light and dark purple, and on her feet were a pair of white shoes. In her mouth was a lollipop, and a stick bobbed when she spoke. Who are you? She brushed past Mocha, walking up to Tsukune, and getting in his personal space, staring at him like she was trying to study him. What are you, doing? Removing the lollipop from her mouth for a moment, she chuckled lightly. So you're Tsukune-kun you're cuter than I expected. The lollipop was plopped back in her mouth, and her hands gently grasped the newspaper in his hands, slowly sliding it out. I'll take a copy. A strange, and random girl began to walk away, waving the newspaper she'd taken over her shoulder as a way of saying her goodbye. I didn't know you had a girlfriend, Tsukune. I don't. He defended hastily. Kurumu's grip around him had visibly tightened. I don't even know who that is. Sir you don't. Naruto grinned at him. It's okay Tsukune, you can tell us. We're all friends here. And she was pretty cute. Mocha frowned while Tsukune grasped Kurumu's wrists, probably in fear of her grip getting any tighter, and choking him out, his face beginning to grow warm. Really. He shuffled uncomfortably. I've never even seen her before. The blonde's blue eyes rolled. 
you're no fun. Naruto sat in his usual spot, Sukune beside him, and Milka seated directly behind him. Up at the front of the class full of students who were only just beginning to settle down was Nakaname, having only recently just made her way inside the room. He zoned out when she started babbling on about how it was the new semester, but mustered up enough attention when she began to talk about some class leader thing. In other words, we'll be electing our class manager. Beside him, Tsukune shrunk in his seat, showing his distaste for such a position. Naruto could feel his own distaste for it bubbling within him, too. His attention dropped when Nakaname's mouth opened once more, she was probably going to go on about it for a while, and he'd rather not listen to her go on and on, especially about something like a class manager. Does anyone have a candidate suggestion? It was silent for a few moments as Nakaname scanned the room, searching for anyone willing to offer someone up as a suggestion. Hey, teacher. Naruto's attention drifted off to the side at the somewhat familiar voice, his eyes coming into contact with the same cute chick who had taken Tsukune's newspaper before class had officially started. She stood up out of her seat, arms still half raised in the air, to keep the attention on her. I think that Tsukune-kun would make a good class manager. Naruto couldn't stop the amused smirk that came to his face. Yeah. He said aloud, nodding his head enthusiastically to show his agreement. Tsukune would make a great class manager. Said teen had at first spun to see the girl from before, was now sending a glare his way. Naruto. He stopped himself when the class started to clap, and his face became mortified. No way. Stop clapping. He all but jumped out of his chair, expression becoming more and more priceless by the second. Seriously, stop it. I'm not going to be the class manager. His protests went unheard. The class even started to chant his name. Once homeroom had ended and everyone had quieted down, everyone began to file out of the room to go to whatever classes they had on next, Sukune grumpily trudging out with everyone else. Congratulations Sukune. Milka smiled genuinely as all three of them walked down the hallway, ignoring the useless chatter of the other students they passed by. Looks like you're going to be the class manager now. He twitched. But I don't want to be class manager, Milka said. Fumbling with the tie round his neck a bit, his lips pursed, voice dropping lower, so no one else around but them could hear him. It'd be a bad idea, even if I wanted to, I'm the only human in this school who can't defend himself, the attention that would come to me from becoming class manager wouldn't be a good thing. Naruto snorted. The yokai in the school aren't much of a problem, Tsukune. He said. Don't be so stiff. I think you'd be a great class manager. You're only saying that, so you can watch me suffer. Details, details. He waved off. That chick from this morning, seems pretty interested in you though. He took personal enjoyment in watching Tsukune's face turn red. Milka placed her index finger under her chin, her luring green eyes scrolling up to the ceiling. Hmm, you're right Naruto, and she was the one to suggest that Tsukune-kun be the class manager. Not you too, Milka-san. She snapped her fingers, eyes sparkling, a bright smile engulfing her face. Hey, after class, why don't we all go buy some snacks? For the party after school. Tsukune's shoulders slumped, and Naruto nodded his head in agreement with her. Yeah, that's a good idea. They kept going down the hallway, just talking, until Tsukune took his turn off as he had a different class than them. The class was boring and droned on and on, like it always did, and Naruto all but sprang out of his seat when it had finished, grabbing Milka and hauling her off in the direction of the campus's store, so they could buy food. She clung to his arm with both of her own, a feeling he began familiarizing himself with a while ago. He got looks of annoyance while she got adoration aimed at her, and he was strangely glad that the place didn't look like it was going to be changing anytime soon. It felt nice. So what are we going to get first? Milka asked. A small, content smile was on her face as they walked. Naruto glanced up at the sign that said campus store on it, hanging above white door and directed them both through it. The store was big, probably bigger than the dorms, and had two floors. The bottom floor was filled with necessities, food, clothes, bedding, shower stuff, etc. While the top floor had pretty much anything that you didn't necessarily need in order to keep living at the school, but more of what you would want. Manga, books, electronics, movies, TV shows, and even a small pet place, but that was heavily regulated, and barely anyone could buy any of the pets, considering they'd usually just get eaten. Most of the stuff on the top floor was imported from the human world, with only some being made by yokai, though, generally speaking, the yokai made stuff sucked pretty bad in comparison. Ramen. He answered without hesitation. Can't have a party without it. Can't have anything without it, really. It just doesn't make sense. If you say so. The campus store didn't have very many people in it, it never really did at one time, even more so during break. The students came and went whenever they felt like it as it was open 24-7. They scooted down the aisles and flicked around the corner, that's when he saw something he didn't expect. Well, kind of anyway. He'd known that Tsukune was here, which is why he came this way in the first place, but he didn't count on the same girl from earlier to be hanging off his arm, both looking through all the stuff that was on the shelves. Come on. He tugged Mocha in another direction, down a different aisle. 
Tsukune is obviously busy with other stuff. As they left, out of the corner of his eye, he caught a glimpse of Tsukune giving him a betrayed look. Naruto shook his head lightly. He could deal with it himself. They flitted around the store, picking up food and drinks for the party, Naruto purposely directing them away from Tsukune's chakra signature whenever it began to get close. When he thought they had finished and were heading towards the checkout, he could sense his friend doing the same, still with the girl, and thought that they'd bump into each other, but Mocha had spotted some more things to grab and had dragged him off. Tsukune and the girl ended up leaving before them, going in the same direction, probably having the same class. We ended up getting a lot of stuff. Mocha mused aloud, her eyes gliding over the bags that Naruto held, and glancing at the one she had, being held up by the arm that wasn't latched around his. Maybe a bit too much. Naruto shrugged. Maybe, but it'll get used eventually. He shifted the bags around in discomfort. The weight of the bags wasn't bothering him, but it was awkward with so many in one hand, and the plastic was digging into him. Here, give me that bag. I've got a free period so I'll take them to my room while school's still on. Oh? She unlatched her arm and held the plastic bag stocked full of Pringles for him to grab, which she did. I won't see you until after school, will I? Naruto paused and thought for a moment. Nope. It's Monday, so we've only got morning classes together. She deflated somewhat at the information, but soon perked back up. Then I'll see you later. She leaned up a bit and planted her lips on his cheek, pulling back a couple of seconds later. Thank you, Naruto. It was fun. She ran down the hall towards her class, leaving a surprise Naruto to watch her leave. Once she'd all but skipped around the corner, he shook his head. He already wanted another one. As her small stone skipped across the lake, the teenage girl cheering when it finally stopped and fell into the lake, with Tsukune clapping dully on the side. Did you see that, Tsukune? She said ecstatically, a smile on her admittedly cute face. That did nine hops, a whole nine hops. Ah, uh, yeah. He murmured as she turned back around, bending over to pick up another small stone. Ah, Shiryuki-san. He said as she stood back up, fumbling with the stone, having learned her name before when they were in the campus store. Speaking of which, he needed to come up with a way to get back at Naruto for leaving him on his own like that. You see, there's this thing that I have to go to. Oh, what is it? She rolled on the balls of her feet. Can I come? There was a small glint in her eye, barely noticeable, and Tsukune didn't like it. Sorry Shiryuki-san, it's just for the newspaper club. Then that makes it easy. She leaped forward and glomped him, arms swinging around his neck, her weight making them spin around until he managed to regain his balance. Noticing his hands had latched onto her waist as a knee-jerk reaction, he quickly pulled them away and brought his sight back up, only to be greeted by Mizer's smiling face. You can spend the time with me instead, it's not going to make a difference, whether you go or not anyway. What do you mean? You're just like me, Tsukune. He tried to inch his way out, but she had a firm grip, and he wasn't going anywhere anytime soon. I can see it in you. You don't belong with them, you don't fit in, you're not like them. When he thought about it, she wasn't wrong. While Naruto was a human like him, he had strength that was just unbelievable, even now, it was like the blonde was as much of a monster as everyone else. Not like us. We were the same, Tsukune. We're both alone. Different, didn't fit in, maybe, but he wasn't alone. If he was, he wouldn't be a part of the newspaper club. He reached up behind his neck and grasped her cold hands, removing them, and breathing out through his nose. Sorry, but you've got the wrong person Shiryuki-san. I'm not alone. Her head began to droop, her hair beginning to overshadow her face as he let go of her hands and began to walk away. He got about five feet before he stopped at her voice. I wouldn't leave if I were you. Her tone was much colder, and it sent a shiver down her spine. I wouldn't be able to help, what happens to Kurumu-san and the others if you do? When he turned his head to face her, it felt like his movements were robotic, eyes widened and a feeling of nausea washing through him. The area around them suddenly started to get much more chilly. What did you do? Stay with me Tsukune. The shallow part of the lake behind her began to freeze over, the wind around them had dropped in temperature and had gotten rougher, whipping at his clothes, while the bushes, leaves, and anything in the area began to crumple lightly, the frosty glaze starting to cover them. Stay with me, and everything will get better. He shivered at the cold. What did you do, Shiryuki-san? Her head snapped back up to look at him with hurt in her eyes. The wind suddenly got a lot harsher, ice formed under her almost instantly, and began to rapidly spread. It got to him, before he had time to react and snared him, traveling up his body. Kurumu hummed as she walked, a smile on her face. In her hand she held a tray filled with cookies, that she made for the party, well, sort of. They were intended for Tsukune to inhale. She thought about lacing them with a love potion to make him fall head over heels in love with her, but decided against it. Both because if someone else happened to eat one then it'd end in disaster, and also because she wanted him to go for her of his own accord. The hairs on her arms started to stick up and she shivered, the temperature in the corridor, that she was alone in losing all warmth and beginning to get cold. Where did that come from? She shook it off and kept walking. It didn't matter. 
As she went, it only got colder and colder. Kurumu turned the corner, while well, not too far away from the club room, and her eyes almost instantly shot wide open, icy and sharp fingers coiling around her neck as she was slammed up against the wall, the tray of cookies flying out of her hand and crash landing against the floor. Her mouth opened to gargle in air, and the fingers around her neck gripped her tighter. You're in the way. It was the girl from this morning, holding her up from the ground, struggling. Her voice was monotone, yet cold and her eyes looked half dead. Kurumu had instinctively grabbed at what was coiling around her neck at first, trying to pry it off with no success, so she let one of her hands free, and kept the other one there, so the girl's hand didn't go any further, and crush her windpipe. She wouldn't be roughed around like this, especially not so easily. The nails of her free hand extended into talons, and she slashed them across her assailant's flesh. Or what she had thought was flesh. Instead, ice burst from her stomach and coated the floor, while surrounding the now missing part of her body was ice. Wow. The girl's grip on her tightened, and she snatched up her hand, slamming it against the wall beside her, ice coating it to keep it locked in place. Sorry to disappoint, but this is my ice puppet, the real me is with Tsukune. I won't let this happen. I'm not going to die like this. Haggardly breathing through her nose, Kurumu went to use her other hand, but ice quickly snapped around it and stopped her from doing so. She wouldn't be letting her do that again. The purple-haired girl's hand that was around her neck was pulled back, parallel to the ground, and an ice claw burst from it, glistening, prime and ready to gutter. Kurumu thrashed around, kicking at the ice puppet, jamming her foot in the missing part of her body and trying to rip her apart with force, but she didn't budge. She was rock solid. She struck forward and the succubus's eyes snapped shut. A shattering sound reached her ears, the weight of the ice puppet's hand left her neck and her mouth opened, air gushing in and filling her lungs as she crashed to the floor, coughing so hard that it hurt. It sounded like glass bouncing and cracking along the floor when she opened her eyes again. School shoes, black socks that went up to just over halfway of her shins, a school skirt, blazer, and a rosary, coupled with a relieved smile, green eyes and pink hair. Mocha bent down to her level, arms resting on her knees. Are you okay, Kurumu-chan? Behind the vampire, was the corpse of the ice puppet in two pieces, bisected pretty much exactly where Kurumu had sliced, and other shards of it scattered about. Any color that had been in the ice puppet was gone. She brought herself up a bit, and rubbed her sore neck. I am now. Mocha breathed out in relief and her smile grew. I'm glad. Her hand came down and Kurumu grabbed it, putting some of her weight on the vampire as she got back up. She gnashed her teeth together. Do you know where Naruto-san is? He's in the club room. I was just heading back there. Mocha's head tilted slightly, questioning in her eyes. Why? Go get him, and tell him to find Tsukune. He's in trouble. Is it that girl? Yeah. Hurry. Right. If you ever get so trapped that you can't move, just force a bunch of chakra out. Think of an explosion. Naruto said, shrugging, as Tsukune swam to the shore, the blonde walking beside him. He'd been trying to get the whole water walking thing down pat, but he wasn't having much success. It didn't help that instead of letting him walk out into the water from land, Naruto insisted on taking him out deep enough to get drenched, and making him try and do it. To be fair, though, it wasn't all that far from land anyway, the lake had a sudden and steep drop, not that far away, which is why they could talk without having to yell to each other. He reached that drop like he had dozens of times over, and pulled himself up, getting on his feet. It was shallow enough now, to walk instead of swim, the water not even reaching his knees. Wouldn't that take a lot of effort? Sure, I guess. Naruto admitted. But I put a lot of my chakra into your system so it shouldn't be much of a problem for you. Just don't go nuts and use so much that you drop dead and you'll be fine. Tsukune was suddenly glad for Naruto throwing out those useful bits of information at random when they trained. Because of them, he managed to break out of the ice that Mizer had captured him in. Right now, he was leaning against a tree not too far from the lake, rubbing his arms in an attempt to stave away the freezing cold that Mizer had caused, trying to hide from said girl. She undoubtedly knew where he was and was on her way, though. I don't have a choice. Tsukune reached into his pocket, fingering the tri-pronged kunai he always kept on his person. I don't have a chance of stopping this woman and whatever she's doing to Kurumu-chan and the others, but Naruto can. He loathed having to rely on other people so much. But he wasn't an idiot. Ripping the blade from his pocket, he tossed it at the ground, watching as it embedded itself in the icy ground. Tsukune managed to take in a couple of breaths before his blonde friend appeared, his right arm slung around the shoulders of the pink-haired vampire. He didn't look to be in the best of moods. Almost immediately after they'd both arrived, Naruto removed his arm and started to walk past Tsukune. You all good? Yeah. He didn't even get a glance as his friend stormed down the slight hill, towards the edge of the lake where Mizu was. He got off the tree. What about Kurumu-chan and everyone else? They're fine. Mocha chimed in for him. She only went after Kurumu-chan and she's on her way here. He couldn't help the relief that engulfed him at that information. A loud whoosh of wind accompanied by popping, hissing, and a sudden immense heat made Tsukune's attention snap towards the lake. 
Naruto was standing where the edge of it would normally be, a 10-foot tall wall of flame erupting from his mouth, rapidly spreading out over the affected area. Within just a couple of minutes, the fire had disappeared, leaving no ice on the lake left, sands for a small concentration of it around the middle, and a small tower of ice on top of that, all the water steaming like a kettle. What surprised Tsukune the most was that nothing had spontaneously caught a flame. Naruto turned his head towards them, eyes narrowed, and the next thing Tsukune knew a kunai had ripped in between the space of him and Mocha. The sound of glass shattering reached his ears, and when he looked behind him he saw a statue of ice, looking roughly like Mizer, with a giant gaping hole in his torso. Ha! He twitched. There'd be no saving anyone hit by that, and it had came damn well close to hitting him. Whoa! Mocha breathed at the gaping hole, not really looking bothered by the near-death experience. That was a close one. Imagine if it had hit either of us, boop. Her eyes closed, her tongue stuck out of the side of her mouth, almost cheekily, while her index finger poked the side of her head, tilting it slightly to the side. Dead. Tsukune deadpanned. You know if Naruto had have missed, one of us would probably be dead. Yuhe. She bobbed her head knowingly with a smile. But he didn't miss, and I don't think he'd have done it if he thought he might miss. I guess. He noticed Naruto walking on the lake towards the middle, where the ice was, out of the corner of his eye. He was about to run down and follow him, despite knowing he couldn't walk on water, but was stopped when something slammed into his back, and two arms were slung around his neck. Tsukune. The grip got tighter. You're alright, thank god. Sighing, he peeled her arms off from around him. Yeah, Kurumu-chan, I'm fine. Naruto had reached a bunch of ice on top of the lake. Tsukune could make out a small poof of smoke come from his hand, he brought his arm up, then slashed diagonally downwards through the small ice tower, barely a foot taller than Naruto himself with enough force to send the surrounding water rippling away in a large amount. The top half of the tower slid off and crashed into the water, sinking, and there was nothing on the inside apart from ice from what Tsukune could see. He blinked and Naruto was no longer standing there. She's gone. His voice came from behind, sounding irritated. I thought that she covered herself in all that ice, but it was just a clone. So you were going to kill her? Tsukune frowned. Despite what she'd done, he felt sorry for her being all alone as she proclaimed. Not really. The blonde shrugged nonchalantly. I could sense her in there for sure, but there wasn't any negative emotions like before, so I had my suspicions. She would have left when I set fire to the place. Hey, anyway. Milka piped up. We've still got a party to put on. Naruto smiled. Yeah, we do. There he was, as stiff as he could possibly be. Unblinking, unmoving, multiple seals strapped to his body and keeping him that way. Ha! Naruto grinned, Kurama's chakra fading away from him. He was exhausted, he felt like he was just going to collapse at any moment, but it didn't matter right now. It won. Ichiha Madara would no longer be taking the lives of anyone else. Turning his head, his eyes landed on his best friend Sasuke. The other team was laid out on his back, arms and legs spread out like a star, his chest moving up and down with each breath he took. Up to his elbow, his left arm was missing. Gone, to never be recovered. But he was alive, and that was the only thing that mattered right now. Naruto began to move towards him, stumbling a few times on his way, but he kept his footing. Sasuke. A lone eye cracked open, black as dark as coal staring straight back at him. We won. The eye shut. He snorted. Of course we did. Stretching his arms above his head, he left his feet slip out from under him, his back colliding with the sand. He'd have complained about the pain, but he couldn't care less at the moment. I can't really believe it. He admitted. It all happened so much faster than I expected. That's just how it is. Sasuke murmured. I guess. They laid still for a few moments, just taking in the silence and enjoying what they'd accomplished. Naruto blinked his eyes open forcefully, squinting he'd almost fallen asleep, and he couldn't let that happen. They were still at war, and if Abito were to show up, then it was over, there was no way he could continue fighting today. Digging under him, and grunting in annoyance as he did so, he ripped out a kunai from his pouch, a tri-pronged kunai, his father's. Without any more thought, he stabbed it into the sand, and suddenly he was there, standing above him, cloak flapping. It's okay. The soothing, familial voice washed over him as his eyes began to close once more. You did well. You can rest now. Naruto groaned lightly, his eyelids slowly opening, sunlight piercing right into his eyes, and making him snap them shut. Trying again, he slowly opened them, wincing at the sunlight, but not backing down this time. Eventually, he managed to get them open enough to consider himself awake. Shifting slightly, he noticed something. There was a weight on his chest and left shoulder. Blinking, he noticed pink. Pink hair. Investigating further, he heard the person's light snores, and tilted his head to get a look at their face smoker. Oh damn. Shifting around some more, but not enough to wake the vampire, he slipped his right arm from under the blanket, and grabbed the top of it, lifting it up, only to push it back down immediately after, face heating up. She didn't have a shirt or bra on. You got to be shitting me. He looked around his dorm room and a mess it was in. 
Empty bottles of alcohol were scattered about. Yukari was passed out on the couch. Tsukune was on the floor, half-dressed, his right foot elevated by a cushion, and Kurumu was asleep against the wall in only a pair of blue bra and panties. Snowing her head off, nearly empty vodka bottle held up by a few of her fingers. Gin was nowhere to be seen. Leaning his head back into his pillow, ignoring Mocha cuddling up to him further and squeezing his arm, he tried to remember the events of the night before. He could remember getting to the newspaper club's room after the thing with Mizer and just relaxing, eating some food and drinking soda, then all of them coming to his room and pouring the first round of shots. He even remembered later on when Gin had dared him to sneak into the headmaster's office and snoop around for a $20 reward, and he'd done it. But after that, nothing. It was strange. He could only blame how much he'd obviously drank last night, but alcohol never really had much of an effect on him what with Karama, being in his gut and all. About that. The Biju's voice rumbled, making him flinch and groan from the throbbing pain it caused. I'm not sealed away inside of you anymore, I'm here of my own violation. I get to say how much my chakra affects your healing capabilities. Wait, what are you saying? You can figure it out. I'm really not in the mood, just tell me. He could almost imagine Karama rolling his eyes in annoyance, but he didn't care right now. Last night, I pulled my chakra back. You didn't have the benefit of alcohol not affecting you. It was just your own tolerance, which is pretty shoddy. You're an asshole. It was amusing. Karama deflected nonchalantly. Especially when you put that teacher's head through walls solely because he said you should get to bed. Naruto cringed. That was going to bite him in the ass. He just knew it. Well give me your chakra again and get rid of this headache for me, you dick. He felt it smoothly gliding through his body, calming him and subduing his headache, so much that it was almost non-existent. He was going to thank the mass of chakra, but was interrupted when a few rapid knocks sounded out from his door. Grunting, he lightly jolted his arm from Mocha's grip, bit by bit until he was free. He slid out of his bed, suddenly aware and glad that he was still fully clothed, and was going to start making his way towards the door but he stopped, glancing back at the soundly sleeping vampire. Maybe he could, just take a peek. It's not like it had hurt anyone. She'd been sleeping without anything covering them for the night anyway. Taking in a breath, he lifted up the blanket, admiring for a few moments before dropping it again, and swiftly making his way to the door. They were pretty damn good. Naruto grabbed a hold of the handle and another knock came, before he jerked the door open, coming face to face with a surprised Ruby. Ruby-chan. She took a quick peek over his shoulder, before shaking her head in dismay. The headmaster wants to see you. Well that sounded like fun. What for? He didn't say. Ruby looked him over, and pursed her lips. He probably didn't look his best. You should clean up first. Nah. Apart from his shoes, he wasn't missing any clothing. And it was a school day, so even if it was in the middle of the day, no one, or not many people, would be around to see him looking like shit anyway. Ruby moved back as he stepped into the hallway, quietly shutting the door behind him. Is he at his office? Yes. Good. He slung his arm around her shoulder. She jolted but didn't get enough time to react properly. Blinking, he took in his new surroundings. A different hallway, a different floor, with a couple of staircases going up. They were in the school. Ubi jerked from his grasp, her hand snapping to her mouth, retching. Naruto grinned. You've got a weak stomach. She seemed to guts it out and swallow the feeling, taking a few deep breaths. What did you do? Secret. Not really, he couldn't care less if she knew, but the annoyance on her face was worth it. He gestured his arm forward, in the direction of the headmaster's office. Lead the way. Her eyes slowly fluttered, the strong stench of liquor immediately attacking her nose. Aside from the smell, it was comfortable and warm. She didn't want to wake up yet. Moaning and groaning, she rolled onto her back, forcing her eyes open, and scrunching her face up at the light. She wasn't in her room, was the first thing she noticed. Craning her neck over the pillow, she glanced around the room, her eyes dashed from Tsukune, to Kurumu, across the countless empty bottles, scattered cards and assorted clothing, and finished on Yukari. Right. They'd had a party last night, to celebrate the newspaper club's success. She remembered some of it, but everything else just wasn't coming to her. Maybe this was why buying alcohol at the school was frowned upon. It was freely available for everyone to purchase, whenever they felt like it, no one was going to physically stop them, but it was heavily discouraged, even more so, while school was on. They were yokai, and while the effects of alcohol would still hit them just as much as anyone else, the supposed after effects were pretty much non-existent, no matter how much they consumed. Mocha slid up out from under the blanket, stretching her arms above her head and yawning. The cool breeze from an open window washed over her, but she didn't relax and enjoy it for long she realized something. It was cold. Snatching up the blanket, she wrapped it around herself as fast as she could, green eyes darting around the room to make sure no one had been awake to see. Now that she thought about it, Naruto wasn't anywhere to be seen. And she was in his bed. She shuffled, feeling her face warm up. Then it hit her she was like this, did that. No. She flinched at the voice, Yura's voice. Flat and to the point. Nothing happened. 
They felt like a weight had been lifted off her shoulders at the revelation. A few moments of silence passed, during which Mocha took the time to look around some more, amusement filling her every time her eyes skinned over one of her friends, until she finally decided it was time to get up. Wrapping the covers around herself, she slipped off the bed, collecting her clothing that was in a somewhat neat pile not far from Kurumu, and went into the bathroom. She needed to get dressed. She wasn't going to walk back to her own room with just the covers over her body. Naruto leaned back into the wooden chair, groaning, staring up at the ceiling with a flat expression. He couldn't see it from this angle, but he was pretty sure he could feel the headmaster's grin directed at him. His eyes flickered down, back to the laptop on the headmaster's desk, facing him, a video playing on full screen. His vision of the video was blurred because he wasn't looking directly at it, but he already knew what it was about last night's activities. Ubi stood in the corner, behind the headmaster, lips twitching. She was having trouble not making fun of him and he knew it. I didn't even know you had cameras here. Of course, I do. His grin didn't dim. Naruto lurched back up and sat properly as the headmaster flipped the laptop around, hit a various amount of keys, and shut it with a quiet click. This is a school for monsters. Aside from Tsukune-kun and yourself, there's no humans here. Fights between students are fairly commonplace here, and they're much more viscous and dangerous than any you'd see between humans. I guess. While confrontations at the school for him hadn't been too much trouble for him, he wasn't on the same level as the people in Tokyo or the rest of the world. Neither was Tsukune anymore, now that he thought about it, he worked hard every day to get better at using his chakra, and was definitely much more capable of handling himself around the school than when he'd first gotten here. So you need to keep tabs on everyone. It's not that personal. He dismissed. Everyone's entitled to their privacy. But in essence, yes. I only had them installed a few years ago, and before then someone was killed weekly, at the minimum. And now? It still happens, but the numbers are significantly less, and the assailants are either suspended or expelled. He paused. During the entire conversation, he hadn't blinked, continuing to stare straight into Naruto's eyes. It was unnerving. To give an example, only three have died since you were enrolled here, well it would have been more than five times that amount before. Naruto's lips thinned. He'd been oblivious to the three deaths, not that it was hard to be, he'd never heard any talk about it, and there had been no funerals or anything of the sort. If there's been three deaths, then why haven't I heard anything about it before now? I've never heard it even mentioned before. It's usually covered up by their families while they mourn, supplying excuses such as the student dropping and the like. And you're okay with that? Yes. It's my responsibility to keep students as safe as I can, it's not any of my business, what happens when they die. It didn't sit well with him people dying and being forgotten by everyone, save for a few. The students must have had friends, did they just gobble up the lies, accept it and move on like nothing happened? He supposed so. I'm assuming that other students don't know, so why are you telling me? You're not a regular student, Naruto-kun. He couldn't really tell, but it looked like the headmaster's lips twitched, just a bit. Or maybe not. I've told you the two main reasons as to why you're at this school. To keep you out of the government's hands, and for eventual coexistence between humans and monsters. Yeah. To be honest, he was glad he'd gotten that invitation. If he hadn't have been given it, he'd probably be constantly running, trying to figure out where he was and what to do. He had no doubt that he'd be able to survive through it, but it's not something that he would want to live through. Besides, he'd always been all for peace, so this coexistence with humans and monsters that the headmaster desired was something he wanted to be a part of. And. And it doesn't matter, if you know these things. He took his hands away from the laptop, finally, resting his elbow on his desk and intertwining his fingers. It's probably better if you do, in the long run. In time, you'll face something far worse, than what you faced in for Jimmy. The more you know about our world and the way it works, the better. You knew about that. He shook his head. Actually, forget it. What do you mean worse than her? Does it have anything to do with fairy tale? Ubi stepped forward from out of the corner. He hadn't taken much notice of what kind of reaction she was having to their conversation, but now she looked awkward, out of place. It was like she wanted to stay, but didn't at the same time. I can leave. His head moved, slightly turning to the side, to give Ruby his attention, and acknowledge her presence. No. We're just about done. He faced towards Naruto once more, not that he'd moved much in the first place. Yes, fairy tale is a big part of it. They're against the idea of coexistence with humans, instead, they want to massacre, and be the ones, to come out on top. Or, the headmaster might as well have said it flat out. As for what's worse, I can't say. Naruto frowned. Why not? Didn't you just say, that the more I knew, the better it was? That's not what I meant. He defended. I can't say because I'm not entirely sure myself, not because I won't. He breathed through his nose. No matter how much you wanted to deny it, no matter how much you wanted it to be false, the facts and heavy implications were there. Even more so with Abito still being alive. Deep down, somehow, he knew it was going to be worse than last time. You did what? Went to Shuriyuki-san's room. 
Naruto gave him a flat, blank stare. He gulped, the blonde probably thought he was an idiot. Given what had happened just a few days before, it probably hadn't been the best idea, but it wasn't like he'd been hurt or anything. Plus the Kaname sensei had guilt tripped him into trying to drag her back to school. Are you an idiot? He deadpanned. Nailed it. No, but. His eyes flickered around. He and Naruto were standing off to the side in the hall, students passing them by, and either ignoring them or glancing and gesturing towards them. Though that wasn't very surprising, Naruto tended to garner a lot of attention having defeated Kaio, and even with all the things he'd done before then. Now that he thought about it, he hadn't seen the guy around at all, maybe he left. The Kaname sensei asked me to, and... And your dumbest said yes. Well, maybe, but I thought I'd be able to smooth things over a bit. Tsukune protested. And then Kasubo sensei came in, he said that shirayuki san had put two students in his soccer team in the hospital. He had bandages wrapped around his head too, which was kind of weird. Naruto froze. His eyes narrowed as he looked away, shuffling a bit on the spot, before recovering and breathing out through his nose roughly. Shouldn't have putting two people in the hospital make you want to stay away even more? He ignored his strange behavior as well as his question and kept on. When I was on my way to her room, he met up with me again. There was something off about him, like he was deranged, and he was going on about how shirayuki san shouldn't be in this school. Then? Naruto pressed. Then I found out that he'd been frozen by shirayuki san before. He blinked, blowing air out of his mouth, to move a straight bang from his vision. Would you say that like it was a big revelation? It's not. Sukune leaned his back against the wall. He just seemed so against shirayuki san and neither of their stories match up. Okay. He seemed more interested in his point now, at least, rather than calling him an idiot, which in itself was ironic considering the blonde's grades were consistently worse than his own. Maybe not by a significant amount, but that was only because Mocha was always helping him study. So what are you going to do about it then? I don't know. What could he do? Kasubo and Mizer's stories were conflicting, and although the latter did seem much more sincere about it, the former was a teacher, a responsible adult, he couldn't just discard what he'd said. He needed to find out who was telling the truth and who wasn't. Maybe I should go and find Shiryuki-san and try to talk to her again. Do you know where she is? Tsukune blinked. He hadn't really known he'd spoken out loud. Ah, no, kind of, maybe. Naruto deadpanned. Well, it's weird, I can't really explain it. Whatever. He brushed off. I'm going back to my room, I'll see you later. And just like that, he was gone. Out of his vision like he wasn't even there to begin with. No noise, no trace, nothing. Just gone. His ability to teleport at will was annoying, even more so when it was straight in his face like that. But now that he gave it some thought, he probably did it on purpose. The legs were held close to her chest, arms wrapped around them, the wind blowing through her hair. Blandly, she stared out over the cliff, past the seemingly endless red ocean, but her mind wasn't focused on it. It was on her most recent encounter with Tsukune. He thought that she was someone to go around hospitalizing other students to satisfy herself. She wasn't. Her lips twitched. She'd said that he'd crossed the line before, but even she didn't know how honest she was being about that anymore. She blinked. Her chest did whirls, making her feel sick. Her entire being felt numb, and she wasn't completely sure why, she'd never felt something like this before. Some of her hair blew in front of her vision, and she raised her hand to gently move it out of the way. Breathing in, she enjoyed the fresh air all around her. It was a favorite place of hers, she often came when she was feeling especially alone, the serene atmosphere filled the deep, dark, empty hole, but it wouldn't last forever. As soon as she left, she knew that the empty feeling would come back once again, but at least she would be able to stomach it for a bit longer. A firm grasp latched onto her shoulders, forcefully hoisting her up. Her attention immediately snapped back to reality. She struggled at first, blurry-eyed, attempting to shake herself out of the grip, trying to force her feet forward, but it was to no avail. As usual. She froze on the spot. It was the voice. His voice. Kasubo. He'd made advances on her before, trying to get into her pants, but she'd rejected him every time, having to freeze him solid last time when he was getting aggressive about it. You always come here when you get depressed, Shiryuki. Upon realizing who it was, she put more effort into struggling out of his grip, simultaneously blinking to remove her blurred vision. Kasubo-sensei. It had came out more pathetic than she'd expected, coupled with a small sniff in there. What are you? Whoa, whoa. He said. There was concern laced in his voice, but it wasn't genuine. There wasn't anything genuine about him. They were less than a meter from the edge of the cliff, and she could feel her heart rate pick up thinking about a possible outcome. You should watch your step, Shiryuki. He was definitely implying what she was thinking. Why did he have to come here? She was pulled back into his chest, shivering when his warm breath collided with her neck. This place has some pretty strong winds. He remarked. Casual, at least that was his attempt, but she could see his lips curling upwards from the corner of her eye. He mused to himself out loud, purposefully, like he was taunting her. 
A girl who constantly skips school and has no friends to care for her. Well, it wouldn't really surprise anyone if she just took a leap, would it? Shiryuki san. Against the wind, the sudden loud shout slammed into her ears. It was somewhat disoriented, so it took a moment for her to realize whose voice it was, but there was no way that she wouldn't know who it belonged to. Tsukune. She grunted and groaned, ramming back and forth against the gym teacher. Let me go. His grasp on her loosed, not by too much, but just enough to let her slip through. The sound of tearing reached her ears. She stumbled back, away from Katsubo and the cliff, the wind hitting against her now revealed left arm and shoulder. He ripped her jacket in an attempt to grab her once more. What was remaining of the left side of it flopped uselessly over her chest. He played with the material for a moment, inspecting it, before deeming it useless and tossing it off the cliff. If she'd still been in his grasp, that could have been her. Tsukune's footsteps were audible now. Shiryuki san. His voice was clear, and much more easily heard too. His tone was confused, he wasn't sure what was happening. What's going on? Nothing. Oh, it's hardly nothing. Katsubo announced. Hands stuffed in his pockets, he began to slowly make his way towards them, a certain air of confidence about him. Mizer flinched, shuffling back. Shiryuki was attempting suicide, she was going to jump off the cliff. If I hadn't have come when I had, she would have succeeded. It was kind of impressive, how he could find a semi-decent lie, and say it so easily. Tsukune's eyes flickered from her bare arm to Katsubo, back, then to Katsubo once more. He deadpanned. That's a bad lie. Oh? The gym teacher stopped. His right hand lifted out of his pocket, to scratch the back of his head. I would have preferred to avoid it, but if you're not going to believe me, then it can't be helped. He shrugged indifferently. I'll just have to kill you. Shiryuki san. She almost jumped. His tone had changed. It was steeled, resolved, but even so, there was still obvious fear in it. We're going to fight. It'll be dangerous, but, will you help me? Yes, obviously. Was her first thought. She'd be stupid to refuse. Even if she was cold enough to just leave him to die, which she wasn't, Kasubo was only going to come after her next. Kasubo's head tilted to the side, the confidence still surrounding him. His arms started to gain rings, his face beginning to bulge, his eyes almost popping out of his head. Yes. Tsukune smiled. Kasubo leaned back, breathing in deeply. He stayed like that for a few moments, back arched, face towards the sky. His lips twitched, and a sudden grin burst into existence, then his entire body exploded. Not into bits, unfortunately, but into tentacles and a giant mass of flesh. A kraken. She'd never seen one transformed before, but she'd heard that they could grow to gigantic sizes so large, in fact, that a single one of their tentacles would be able to crush a large boat without problem. But, Katsubo's size wasn't that big. At least not yet. But with that being said, he was still many times larger than they were. Here he comes. Right on cue, one of his tentacles shot forward at a rapid pace. It was fast, but thanks to the distance, they were both able to avoid it. But that didn't mean they could avoid the others. Two slimy tentacles, just a bit wider than her waist, wrapped themselves around her legs, quickly reaching above her thigh highs and sticking. She only got to think about freezing them before she felt weightless, when slicing at her face and body. Releasing a short scream, she flailed her arms. She was high up in the air, very high. Below her, she could see Kasubo's tentacles swinging around wildly, save for one. It was stuck still, seemingly flat on the ground, but she could see Tsukune underneath it, struggling. She shook her head fiercely. She was falling, and the ground was going to be her deathbed. It got larger and larger, the grass becoming more detailed the closer she got. A screech, a shout, and she was tumbling. She felt sick. Head spinning, she fumbled around, almost falling as she tried to get up on her knees, before releasing the contents of her stomach onto the ground. Ha, ha. She blinked rapidly, lips trembling. She was alive. Somehow. Spitting out what was hopefully the last of it, she jerked her head to a groan. Tsukune coughed, shaking his head in disgust. That's gross. I can't help it. Despite the near-death experience, a small smile came to her face. I almost died. Yeah. He smiled bitterly, glancing over to where Katsubo was. But it's over now. Eh? A large shadow passed over them. She looked up, a large UFO with little stubs protruding from spinning in circles through the air. She watched as it passed over them, a dumbfounded expression taking over her face, then watched as it slammed into the ground, denting the landscape and sending a strong gust of wind rushing over them. Tsukune didn't seem to notice it, or he just chose to not pay any attention. I'm still nowhere near strong enough to fight a monster. Eh? Tsukune. That was another familiar voice, kind of. She turned her head, something flashy and metal whizzing by her face and sticking into the ground. Her eyes landed on him Naruto. He looked annoyed, the end of the tentacle held in his hand, the rest of it dragging behind him. His eyes narrowed. Are you an idiot? The tentacle swung around at incredible speeds, going over her surprised head, colliding with something behind her. 
Whatever it had hit moaned out loud, grumbling as the tentacle kept going until the blonde released it, sending it flying out into the ocean with a splash. Wah. Ugh. She turned back to Tsukune, who was cradling the back of his head as he laid in the dirt. He grumbled. That was uncalled for. No, it wasn't. Naruto retorted swiftly, without remorse. If you hadn't called me, you'd be dead. What made you think you could take on a yokai at the moment, even with Mr. Chan's help? Mr. Chan? She went ignored. Naruto didn't get an answer. Sighing, he breathed out through his nose. It doesn't matter now, I guess. Within a few more steps he was right in their space. Come on, both of you get up. We're going back. Tsukune grunted and rolled over, pushing himself onto his knees then to his feet. Wait. Mizer spoke up, grabbing their attention this time. What about Katsubo-sensei? He's not dead. Naruto shrugged. Not yet anyway. If he bleeds out that's his own fault. The atmosphere was dull and boring. Out of the 30 or so people that had showed up the man's friends, some higher ups, and his two brothers there was absolutely no one that she cared about. But here she was, suffering through the boredom of a funeral, all for the sake of recruitment. The man who died, a vampire, Suri, that was his family name at least, she was never given a first name, had gone along with her to Fujimi City. His killer was unknown, but that didn't matter. What did matter, was that he'd been set up by Jaikuro. She wanted him to die by the enemy's hands, that way they could convince his two brothers to join them for a chance of revenge. While his skill hadn't been very impressive, having to use a gun loaded with silver bullets, to be on par with other vampires, his brothers were apparently a different story, so Jaikuro claimed. That's what had led Akira to be here, bored out of her mind, and pretending to care about someone she didn't even know. Up at the front of the room, one of Suri's commanding officers rambled on about him, listing off his accomplishments like they held any significance. She sat there, her mind began to wonder. What had Jai Kuro been thinking when she'd ordered her to assist humans, of all the damned species, in slaughtering everyone in a city, not to say she didn't enjoy it. She knew what the humans gained, a mass reserve of oil, that was under the land as well as the added bonus of purging a city so far in debt, that it was almost laughable, but what about them, fairy tale? As far as she was aware, they were just used and got nothing out of the deal. Thinking back more about Fujimi City, her mind came back to the blonde Naruto. He'd been her target, some of importance, someone that needed to die for fairy tale to succeed. And she could very easily see why. Well during the majority of their fight had been rather even, as soon as he'd been coated in that golden glow, she'd been able to feel it all of that raw power, billowing off of him in waves. It was intense. If that masked man hadn't came when he did, she would undoubtedly be dead. She needed to get stronger, faster. She wasn't good enough. Naruto was still her target, and would remain so until he died at her hands. But that didn't mean she was going to go after him, when the outcome of any confrontation would be her loss. No, she had to wait and improve until she was certain she could deal with him. Akua knew, with complete certainty, that the next time she met him, death would be involved. Thanks for listening. I do hope you enjoyed. If you want a next part of this video, like subscribe, and comment down below, and turn on that bell notification, and also check out the other videos that I have created, and enjoy. See you in the next video. Peace.